verses 1 through 13. Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pashur, Jehukal, son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, son of Melchijah, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, This is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Then the official said to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in the city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of the people, but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. But Abed Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Abed Melech went out of the palace and said to him, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly, and all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. And the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Cushite, Take thirty men from here with you, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there, and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ebed-Melech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, Put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. So far, a text. Dear Christian friends, it's halftime. The team is getting pounded. And the water boy stands up and says, Give up now! Don't go back out in the field! If you do, not only will you lose, but you'll die. Run away. Flee before halftime starts. That's not necessarily the message people want to hear. And yet this is the message that Jeremiah gave to God's people. It was really rough. Judah was in disbelief. They saw what had happened to the northern ten tribes. Last week we talked about the Assyrians coming in and wiping out Israel. This week it's Judah's turn. They had turned away from God. They weren't worried about the Savior of the world coming. They weren't even sure who God was. They didn't really care. And so in a last desperate attempt to save the remaining remnant, God shook them. He was about to have them destroyed. This was not fun to hear. And I don't think any of us likes to hear that God has set us up on a tee and is pulling out his driver and is about to whack us 300 yards. But that was the message that Jeremiah was bringing to God's people. So, what are you going to do? You're Jeremiah. And you're thrown in jail. And they let you out so you can talk to the people. And you stand there. Do you think there was a temptation for him not to say these words? He's telling all the people, this is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. He's talking about treason, isn't he? Whether it's the water boy or a U.S. senator, how many of you want to hear that? None of you. If this was the message of judgment in God's law, 
And that was all that was left for God's people. This is not necessarily a really chipper Sunday when we talk about cross-bearing. And yet as it comes up, I don't think it's ever a bad time. The longer I live, I don't know if there's ever really a good time in people's lives. We're surrounded by sin in the world. We're clothed with sinful flesh and our heart thinks up creative ways to sin more. And so, the cross that we bear, the temptation to go against our God and His will, those are real. And so you have to ask when uh, Jeremiah gets dropped into the cistern, a cistern is just a giant pit where they used to store water. It's the dry season and there's no water in it, but there's mud. So Jeremiah gets lured into it and he probably goes up to what, his ankles, halfway up his shins in mud? And he's sitting there. Is that the lowest point of his life? Literally and figuratively. Remember, he just got out of jail. So this is probably a step down, in my opinion. And he's sitting there. What are they going to do to me next? Well, I think that it's a fit time to maybe talk about the low times in your life. Do you ever have these questions run through your mind? I have a right to be happy. And since I do, you don't actually, then I can go after that greased pig of happiness and try to catch him. And what I do, I can hold on to him for maybe a couple minutes, maybe a week, maybe a month. But the problem is that he's going to get away. And in the process, I've just been covered in mud and dirt. People think that they have a right to happiness. And so they say, I can abuse God's gifts of sex, alcohol, drugs. I can trot all over all of his commandments for my own happiness sake, right? Because I have a right to be happy. He doesn't tell us that. He gives us something different, doesn't he? He talks about contentment. And how contentment is something to seek after. That is possible with God. To know that every day, God won't necessarily make you happy, but he will provide for your needs. To realize that your end isn't here in life. God has a home for you. Waiting in heaven. It'll be glorious. People say, I have the right to be successful. That means that I should neglect my own spiritual health and the spiritual health of my family as I consume and fill my life with all kinds of things so I can walk away knowing that I've accomplished something in this world. Well, sometimes I think the American dream can be a nightmare. And people wake up at some point in their life and they look around and they wonder if they've actually accomplished anything as they've alienated all those that they love. And they wonder if it's really worth it. It, of course, is not. God says that you are successful if you follow my will for your life. You have true success when you bring yourself and your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You have true success when you can witness to other people, not so that they believe the word, but that in the process you give glory to God. God gives no guarantees with your witness. He just commands you to be faithful. I have the right to be independent. That means that if I may be landlocked in a job or a lifestyle or a sickness that I don't like, I have the right to free myself from that. God doesn't actually say that. There was an author, maybe you've heard of him, Robert Louis Stevenson, he is the original pirate. He is the original adventurer. This is the guy who was bedridden for most of his life with tuberculosis. And every day his wife would walk up to him and say, is it going to be a good day? He says, as long as a row of bottles and pills do not block the view of my horizon, it will be a wonderful day. This man who was bedridden his whole life wrote Treasure Island. He's the guy who coined Yo-Ho-Ho in a bottle of rum, fourth graders that study pirates in North Carolina. Yeah. He's also the guy who wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. 
How is that possible that someone who we might say his life was, was that meaningless or limited? How could he be free to do that? Do you realize that true independence is found only in a relationship with your God? Only that are you truly free. Freedom isn't being able to do whatever you want. Freedom is being able to do whatever God wants. That sounds counterintuitive, and yet you look at all the people in this world who can't or won't or don't want to do what God's will is. They are slaves to their sin, to the whims of society, and the waves of culture that change constantly. True freedom, true independence is found with God. And I've met people, again, who are maybe crippled, maybe don't have all the use of their limbs, maybe have a chronic illness that leaves them bedridden. And yet you talk to them and you never know it. Because they've found peace and freedom in their God. Your friends, embracing the cross seems like an insane thing to do. Why would we ever do that? Why would you walk up to something miserable and grab it and run? And yet, when you talk to theologians and old people who have been struggled, they talk about their dear cross. <laughs> that's crazy. But it's because that's what brings them closer to Christ. God never promises you happiness. In fact, he promises the exact opposite. He promises you persecution and suffering. That's his promise. And the lie that the rest of the world wants to say is that their cup isn't leaking, when the reality is that's the reality for everyone. And so, the only place you can be closer to God is when you grab your cross and you realize that this temptation and this suffering is a reminder that I, how desperately I need my God. Because God's goal is to keep us close and get us out of this veil of tears in one spiritual peace that we can live eternity with him in glory. I don't know of a more cheerful message, frankly, than that. That there is a rescue plan. You heard this Ebed Melech. That is uh, some good Hebrew for servant of the king. Ebed Melech. Servant of the king. That's all it means. He's a Cushite. North African. He's not a Jew by race or descent. And yet... He saw Jeremiah's cross, and it caused his faith to be burned into a fire, so that he approached the king, risked his life, and said, What are you doing? To him to rebuke the king, this godless man who should have known better? This noodle who's watching his country fall to pieces gets rebuked by a foreigner and says, Okay, fine, you can lift the prophet out. I asked if this was the lowest point in Jeremiah's life. It wasn't. What, what would be worse than telling people that the city is going to be destroyed? Watching the city be destroyed. And yet it's at that point that the prophet Jeremiah penned these words in lamentation. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the, bitter, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. There was a city that was being, it was under siege. And uh, it was under siege for about six months. And when there's a siege, they just kind of surround them and they just don't let anyone in or out and they assume that the people will starve. And then they give up. It's way easier than fighting a battle, right? Just wait for them to come out and surrender. Well, it's been six months, and they, you know, throw over a note, are you ready to surrender? And in response, the people in the city threw out ten fish. 
Because the city was not too far from the sea, and there was an underground aquifer that led to the ocean and a limitless supply of seafood. And there was no way the city could be broken because of this limitless supply of food. I'm not suggesting that you throw fish to the people and the troubles in your life. I'm reminding the, you that you are under siege, Christian. But you have a limitless supply of God's love found in his word. And you can go to it in six, ten different ways and feed your soul. And hear about his forgiveness and his love and his mercy. How great is his compassion. Wake up every morning and knowing that they don't fail. Even as you see Jerusalem burn, you can have this faith that cannot be shaken. This is what Jeremiah had. And so I have to say, I don't know if Jeremiah had a low point. I mean, in reality, he'd probably say, well, that wasn't very good. I didn't like that. And yet at the lowest point possible, he could have that testament to God's grace and mercy. That's extremely powerful. And so you. There's no difference from the faith that held up Jeremiah and yours. What cross do you bear? None is so great that your God cannot sustain you. Dear friends, you do not walk alone. Your God walks with you. You do not bear your crosses alone. He's by your side. May you see the cross in your life for what it is. Embrace it and stay close to your God. Amen. Please stand.